It's the 27th of July 1985, and the airwaves of Radio Uganda crackle with a historical announcement. A man steps into the limelight, declaring the toppling of the current government, the dissolution of all arms of government, and the abrupt end of the parliament. In a surprising twist, the army is reaffirmed to take charge of day-to-day -day government activities. The central figure in this political upheaval was none other than Dr. Apollo Milton Obote. This was a coup taking place against him. Yet this isn't the first coup Obote had grappled with. The first one had occurred on January 1971 when Field Marshal Idi Amin Dada successfully also tested the first coup against Obote's government, and the second by Basilio Olara Okelo, aided by General Kito Kelo Lutwa. In this episode of Uganda in History, we embark on an intriguing exploration of the life story of Uganda's first executive prime minister, Dr. Apollo Milton Obote. From his meteoric rise to power, to the intense power struggle with the Kabaka Edward Mutesa II, to the dramatic coups that brought an end to both of his governments, Obote's narrative unfolds as a tapestry of the trims, controversies, and political turbulence that left an indelible mark on the nation's history. Apollo Milton Obote was born in a Kokoro village in northern Uganda on December 28, 1925. But this isn't just any old story. Apollo was just a regular kid from the block. He was the third of the nine children born in a tribe named as the Onyimba clan, which was part of a vibrant Lango ethnic group. Now let's fast forward to 1940, when Apollo at the tender age of 11 decided to kick off his educational journey in the Katazim class. One year later, is not just flipping through textbooks but traveling six miles on foot to Ibuge Primary School and then to Boroboro Primary School near Lira. The guy was on a mission, but here's the twist. Obote didn't start out dreaming of political dominance. He had his sights on law, a degree that he wanted to pursue at Makerere College. But unfortunately, Makerere did offer law at the moment, so he settled for a general arts course. But trust me, it wasn't a boring ride. Now, rumor has it that he may have been kicked out of Makerere University for leading a strike, something that he insists that he didn't lead. Now, fast forward to 1963 and suddenly, Dr. Obote is in the house. He bags an honorary doctor of law from the Long Island University in the US and a year later, snags the same title from the University of the Hill in India. But the drama doesn't stop there. When Makerere University upgrades to a fully-fledged university in 1970, and Apollo Milton Obote will become the university's first chancellor. Now let's rewind a bit to Obote's early working days in Uganda and Kenya, where he's not just crunching numbers but also laying foundation for his political career. It all started in Kenya where he joined the Kenyan African Union, and that's where things get interesting. In 1956, with a movement brewing back home, he bids farewell to Kenya and jumps headfirst into the political whirlwind in Uganda. The British government's land tenure plant in Lango, he wasn't having fun of it. Obote, along with the people and the UNC in Lango, throw down the gantlet, organizing protests in Lira and gets arrested, but that doesn't stop him. Now, fast forward to 1956, Obote returns to Uganda and throws his heart into the political ring by joining the Uganda National Congress, UNC, and in 1957, he clinches a seat in the Colonial Legislative Council. In 1959, the UNC decides to split in two factions. The Obote faction would go on to merge with the Uganda's People's Union, UPU, forming the Uganda's People's Congress, UPC. It's a political drama at the finest. Now, Apollo Milton Obote was the only president who kicked back into the State House on two separate occasions. First in the 1960s, right after independence, and then again between 1981 to 1985, after the Idi Amin era. And remember the iconic national flag handed over at the Independence Day on October 9, 1962? It was Obote who held a symbolically significant piece of history when he and Grace Ibingera played a crucial hand in designing it. But it's not all smooth sailing. Obote representing the UPC at the Uganda Constitutional Conference in 1961 faces internal power struggles. Now the UNC's message of independence now turns into a power play, leading into a split within the party. Now, Jolly Joe Chuanka's antics and a Moscow money scandal sparks a party breakup. Now, immediately after independence, Obote embarked on an international journey to bluster Uganda's global relations. He visited John F. Kennedy at the White House and later addressed the UN General Assembly. He later on went to witness the Ugandan flag being raised for the first time on foreign soil at the UN General Assembly headquarters in New York. 
Now, his entourage included key figures such as James Simpson, the Minister of Economic Affairs, John Kakonge, the Secretary General of the UPC Party, Apollo Chironde, his UN Permanent Representative, and Grace Ivingera, his Minister for Justice. Now, fast forward to the run-up to the independence election, and Obote is playing a chess game claiming that the Democratic Party failed to organize an effective government. Now, to the shake-up of things, the UPC KOI alliance is born, and only Mutesa and Obote is on the secret. The UPC Central Executive Committee, they were all in the dark. In the end, the alliance mission is clear. Kick DP out of the office. Now, the April 1962 election sees UPC with 24 seats, DP with 24 seats, and the KY with 21 seats. Now, to form a government, the Kabaka Yeka KY merges with the Uganda's People's Congress UPC, which enables Oboti to become the first Prime Minister of Uganda with executive powers. So there we were, riding high on Oboti's political roller coaster, when suddenly a gold smuggling plot shakes the very foundations of the Prime Ministership. Now picture this Oboti and a young Idi Amin both implicated in the scheme. Now the parliament smells trouble and demands an investigation, calling for Amin to be ousted. Now, Anobote is not having any fun of it. In a tense and rapid intense, he decides to arrest four ministers who he accuses of trying to wage a coup against him. And he goes on to abolish the constitution, replacing it with what would be known as the Pionol Constitution. This got the name after he ordered the members of parliament to pick the very constitution from their respective pigeon hole cabins within the parliament chambers. Now, Obote would belong to a famous crop of African leaders who would be known as the founding fathers of their countries. Alongside other presidents like Kene Kaunda of Zambia, Jomi Kenyatta of Kenya, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, and Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, to mention but a few. In 1967, Obote solidifies his grip on power with a new constitution, waving goodbye to the federal structures of the independence constitution and ushering in an executive presidency. Now fast forward to 1969 and Obote unveils the Common Man's Charter, a socialist manifesto that becomes known as a move to the left. But here's the kicker. Corruption runs wild where private corporations and banks fall under the government control, where food shortages drive prices throughout the roof. This was Obote's version of socialism. Now meanwhile on the international stage, Obote's dance with the Israeli government takes a turn for the worse. The Israelis who are training the Ugandan police were also providing arms to rebels in the southern Sudan, something that the Ugandan government wasn't too thrilled about. Obote goes on to withdraw support and arrest a German mercenary and extradites him back to Sudan for trial. The Israel government were not happy with the turn of these events. It's February 9th, 1966, when King Mutesa II makes a phone call to the British High Commissioner desperately seeking for military assistance. When questioned by Obote about the need for the arms, Mutesa with the enigma simply swerved him off. Now, despite him being a president, head of state, and the commander-in-chief, he didn't have any authority to order for arms. Obote seeking counsel from his attorney general, Godfrey Binaisa, faces a dilemma. Binaisa advises Obote to suspend Mutesa and the constitution itself, which Obote found as challenging as barring his own child. Now, fast forward to May 20th, the Bugandan parliament passes a resolution refusing to recognize the government and demanding that its headquarters be moved from the Buganda soil. Now, Obote retaining the calm despite the storm arrests three chiefs for organizing a rebellion, but the storm was just beginning. Now, on May 24th, 1966, Obote ordered an assault on the Loviri Palace in Kampala, the residency of King Edward Mutesa II. Now, the attack aimed to dislodge Mutesa from power, resulting into a substantial damage which caused damages to his Royal Royce cars. However, Mutesa managed to escape and sought refuge to the British High Commission office, a move that marked a turning point in Uganda's politics. Now, this assault and its aftermath were instrumental in shaping Uganda's political landscape. Now, enter Idi Amin who capitalized on this chaos, eventually seizing power in the famous 1971 military coup. The central government's relationship with the traditional institutions in Uganda were forever altered. But wait, the plot thickens. In the aftermath of the Mengo assault, Obote would face multiple assassination attempts. Now, on December 19, 1969, while leaving the UPC delegates conference, an attempt on his life unfolded. An assassin named Muhammad Sebaduka fired a shot at Obote, breaking his teeth and passing through his cheeks. Another assassin named Viwane Wamala threw a grenade, but it failed to explode. Now, both conspirators would go on to escape. 
but in the aftermath, now all political parties would go on to be banned, leaving Obote as an effectively absolute ruler. Now a state of emergency would go on to Rome, and Obote's political opponents were jailed without trial for life. Obote's regime would unleash terror, harassment, and torture, with its secret police known as the General Service Unit, GSU, becoming synonymous with cruelty. Now, as if the political timeline in Uganda couldn't get any worse. Now, let's fast forward to the aftermath of the political crisis and the attempts on Obote's life. Now, Idi Amin, the army commander at the time, mysteriously goes missing, and the investigations into the assassination all lead straight to him. Now, before Obote departs for Singapore in January 1971, he confronts Amin and the Minister of Defense, Felix Onam, about a missing 2.6 million shillings in the defense budget. Now, Obote claiming that he had led a clean government, tasks Amin and Onama to find the missing money before he would return. Now, reluctantly leaving for Singapore, due to an impeding election and a government development plan, Obote is unaware of the storm that was brewing back home. Now, while in Singapore, Obote represents the African case against the British decision to resume arms sales to the apartheid government of South Africa. So far, Mr. Heath has not told me whether uh, the British have interests in Uganda. I believe the British have interests in Uganda. I give you one example, namely that uh, our trade with the rest of the world a, represents a strong British interest. We buy from the rest of the world and British goods in Uganda amount to 40% of what we buy from all countries in the world. I suppose that is a British interest. But it looks to me as if Mr. Hughes will have to tell me whether he's prepared to write off that interest not only in Uganda, but in other parts of Africa. Uh, a British newspaper has reported of some uh, contingents of British Navy uh, near Mombasa. I can say that if, that if the report is true, the British Navy near Mombasa is too near us for comfort. in view of the present tense situation in this country. Now, the British Prime Minister Edward his statement hints at a brewing coup back at home in Uganda when he makes a statement saying, those of you who are condemning the British policy to sell arms to South Africa, some of them will not go back to their countries. Worried, Obote contacts his trusted allies back at home, including John Babiha, his vice president, and Basil Baterangaya, the minister of internal affairs, who go on to confirm that an attempted coup was looming, but assured him that they had handled it. But the bombshell drops when Baterangaya informs Obote that the coup had succeeded. The members of the Uganda Army and Air Force decided to take over from the civilian role because of the, the last arrangement which were made by the Dr. Apollo Milton Obote to disarm the whole tribe of Uganda except his own tribe, Langi and Achodi. And also, that is the point which brought all this problem. Have you been well treated, Madam Abote? Yes. What is how, your... How have the children taken all this, Mrs. Abote? We've got the children yeah. here with you. How are you? All right. And you? I'm, I'm all right. Have you heard from Daddy? What's your name? Akaki. And yours? Akela. Amin would later claim that the army had tasked him to take over the government. Now Obote gathers his delegation, briefing them on the situation and tells them that their loyalty would end there. And then they must decide on their fate, either to return to Uganda or join him in exile. Uganda-wide rebellion. Amin has turned the gun 
both out of the sweat and toil of the people of Uganda against those same people. He has turned the pearl of Africa into a human slaughterhouse. Terror, more than anything else, has sustained him and his regime throughout the past eight years. Consequently, there have been many attempts by Ugandans to rid themselves of the scourge of terror. Now is the time for Ugandans to close ranks and coordinate their efforts. Gobote rushes to Nairobi to rally loyalist army and elements against Amin, but faces resistance from the Kenyan authorities. Now, pro Obote soldiers failed to organize a counter offensive, leading to a swift purge by the pro Amin forces. And third, Obote moves on to Tanzania, where he finds more support from the president, Julius Nyerere. Now, plans for a Tanzanian Somalia invasion to help Obote regain power were derailed by the Chinese opposition and fears of Western intervention. Now, Obote's loyalists in the Ugandan army were crushed, and Julius Nyerere offers him training camps in Tanzania to organize guerrilla army in exile. Now, thousands of Obote supporters would go on to flee to Sudan, which offered sanctuary and training camps. Now, from March 1971, Obote builds up a rebel army in Sudan. However, his exile efforts faces challenges with lack of support, ethnic tensions, personal rivalries, and a treaty between Sudan and Amin, expelling Obote and his followers. Now, unable to mobilize more than a thousand insurgents, Obote's exile becomes a struggle. Now, the Tanzanian government, initially supportive, officially closes the insurgent camps after the 1972 invasion of Uganda by the Obote's rebel alliances would go on to prove disastrous. Now, Obote and his inner circle would go on to relocate to Dar es Salaam, where they would take on various professions, and Obote would continue to plot against Amin. Now, living off a Tanzanian pension, Obote would go on to live a low profile. The Moshi Conference where the Ugandan National Liberation Front was born, the conference would go on to set a stage for the downfall of Idi Amin's government, thanks to the combined effort of the Tanzanian army and the Ugandan exile troops. In the aftermath, Yusuf Lule, the leader of the UNLF, would become the president of Uganda in exile. Now, the UNLF shifted from Dar es Salaam to Kampala once Amin was overthrown, and Lule would go on to be sworn as the president. Now, meanwhile, back in Tanzania, Obote would find himself on a high table with Lule, President Nyerere, and Rugumayo discussing the disagreements within the UNLF. Now, Obote, the ever after political smooth sayer, predicted a short lived nature of the Lule's government. Now, early in 1980, while at his presidential lodge in Tanzania, Obote would go on to make a press statement about his intention to return to Uganda and contest in the upcoming elections. At a conference like this, I hope that I shall be returning to Uganda on May the 27th of this month, May the 27th. I have not been invited by the government, but the local people everywhere in Uganda have sent delegations from time to time asking me to return home. A committee has been set up at the national level and this committee has not only fixed the date but has also selected where I should go. I shall be going to the western region in the district of Bushenyi. Now, on the 28th of May 1980, aboard a helicopter from Arusha, he landed in the district of Imbarara, welcomed by numerous supporters, including John Babiha, his vice president, and many others. Now, brace yourself for the 1980 elections. An Obote's Uganda's People's Congress, UPC, emerged victorious, but allegations of election rigging sparked a Golera war, led by Yore Museveni's National Resistance Army and other military groups. Now, Obote holding the additional title of the Minister of Finance faced a national tamloy. Now, the year 1983 would see the launch of Operation Bonanza by the Obote's government, 
a military expedition which would lead to devastating consequences. Now, tens of thousands of lives would be lost and a significant portion of the population would be displaced. Now, the blame for this massacre would fall on the people of northern Uganda, exacerbating the existing regional tensions. Now, but the roller coaster ride doesn't end there. On July 27, 1985, lightning struck twice. Obote was deposed again, and this time by his own army commanders in a military coup, which was led by Brigadier Basilio Olara Okello and General Tito Okello Lutwa. That took the reins and making yet another turbulent history in the Ugandan's politics. Now, as if the Mengo crisis, the coup attempts, and the changing governments were not enough, entered the political crisis involving the army. A crisis that would ultimately force Obote to make a dramatic escape. Now, the signs began to show during the cooperative day in Imbali, where Obote sensed something amiss with the army's movement in Kampala. Now, Paul Mwanga, the ever harbinger of trouble, issued a statement about uncoordinated troop movements back in Kampala. Obote appointed Brigadier Livingstone Ogwang to investigate, but frustrations ensured. Now, Mwanga then approached Obote, suggesting that Tito Kelo should bring Basilio Okello to Kampala, a move that would set the stage for the coup. Now, unbeknown to Obote, Tito Kelo, once sent on the mission, never returned as expected. Instead, he returned with an invasion army, the very force all suggesting the coup. Now, despite these brewing storms, Obote remained confident, focused on organizing the December 1985 elections, believing that the UPC's victory would thwart any coup attempts. Then comes the night of July 26, 1985. Mwanga urgently called Obote, warning him of the unfolding events in Kampala, advising him not to stay in Nile mansions or even go to the parliament building. Mwanga would hint at the seriousness of the situation. In response, Obote, fully aware of the stakes, makes a series of calls to colleagues, expressing his unwillingness to face another fight. He declared, I have fought I mean, I do not want to fight again. I am going to die here. Now, in a moment of true friendship, one of Obote's close allies insisted on getting him out of the country, stating that if he was alive, they could fight, but if he was dead, they couldn't do so. So, in a daring escape, Obote made his way through the districts of Jinja and Tororo until reaching the Kenyan border. As if twists and turns of the Uganda's political landscape couldn't get more complex, we fast forward to 2005, when a surprising development occurs. Reports start to circulate that Apollo Milton Obote, the central figure in Uganda's tumultuous political history, was contemplating a return to his homeland before the year ends. However, fate had other plans. On October 10, 2005, news breaks that Apollo Milton Obote had passed away in a hospital in Johannesburg, South Africa, succumbing to a kidney failure at the age of 79. Now, this marks the end of an era a final chapter in the life of a man who played a pivotal role in shaping Uganda's destiny. Now, in a twist that resonates with the unpredictable nature of politics, Apollo Milton Obote is granted a state funeral in Kampala, Uganda, the capital, on October 2005. Now, to the surprise and appreciation of many, President Museveni, once his bitter rival, attends the ceremony, symbolizing a moment of reconciliation in the nation's history. Now, Obote's legacy lives on through his family. He is survived by his wife and five children. Mia Obote, his wife, steps into the political arena, being elected as the president of the Uganda's People's Congress UPC party on November 28, 2005. Now, as the final curtain falls on Apollo Milton Obote's life, his impact on Uganda's political landscape remains a complex tapestry of the dreams, controversies, and reconciliations. Now, the saga of Uganda's political history continues, shaped by a legacy of those who play the key roles in the turbulent past. Now, if you found this video informative and engaging, don't forget to give it a like, share, and subscribe to help the channel grow. This has been Regan for Uganda in History, and see you in another video.